unexpected, but a slightly less familiar scene, the card scene. Yes. Why especially? What do you feel about Carmen in this scene? My thoughts when I'm singing this aria, when I'm doing this on stage, I, at that point, I, I'm very much disgusted with Don Jose. I have finished with him. He is to me a very stupid, a very uninteresting, a very unmanly person at this particular time and I want to be done with him. At the same time, I here I am, I'm seeing that in the cards, it, it says to me that I'm going to die first and then he's going to follow me. We're both, both going to die. And this is what this aria, I feel, is about. <laughs>
What is the proportion now, as a matter of interest, between a concert recital and opera? The recital work is obviously very important. It is very important. Now, why to me. especially? Well, it goes back really to my childhood. Um, I would like to have been able to answer that by saying because I just feel that, you know, I, I fell in love with recitals just like that. That would not be the whole truth. I was brought up in a very, very religious family. I was born in New Orleans. I was reared in California. But because I came from that particular kind of background, opera was frowned on. I heard my first opera, actually, when I think I was 14 or 15 years old, which was quite late because some people begin with opera. So I would say my love of the recitals came from that early kind of conditioning. What, what sort of proportion, when, how, do they, how does your work divide now between recital as opposed to opera, roughly? Roughly speaking, I would say 50% on each side. 50% opera, 50% recital. And I would like to keep it like that um, until I stop singing. Because to me, my recitals are a great discipline for me, personally. It keeps me quite in shape. It keeps me on the straight and narrow. It, it makes me very um, attentive to f kinds of habits and faults that might creep in to the singing, which happens all the time. You know, when one works a lot, you do get into bad habits. And I feel that recitals keep me a little bit rehearsing a lot to keep the faults a a to a minimum. Now, the very thoroughness of this approach of yours brings you up against another problem, which is the manifest inadequacy of so many opera libretti as compared to the music. Um, now, of the obvious example, Nazib Chena, Ved in Verdi Strevatore, what beautiful music and dramatic part though it is, the words yes. could be said to be a lot of nonsense. How, yet you've got to convey them as though they're not. Now, how do you get over this problem? Well. I get over it by playing a game with myself, a game that has also helped me in, in portraying a role on stage, and that is, what if, imagining that it could have happened. And from that standpoint, I've been able to get over that hurdle of, you know, some of the words, uh, that some of the libretti really are very, very, very foolish, repetitious, and um, yes. Do you ever feel that, do you ever feel envious wish that fate had dealt you a soprano voice and not a mezzo in that so many of the huge star roles are for sopranos and for instance as you china in trovatore you're going to sing uh, i nostri monti which is a very dramatic and marvelous uh, piece of music but don't you ever feel you'd rather be singing leonora in that opera and be singing the miserere just before it absolutely absolutely I love this music of Leonora, and this is one role that I have said that because of the way it's written, it would be a joy to sing, you know, if I were a soprano, and um, I'm not. But it would be wonderful just to sing, uh, you know, the, the wonderful limpid kinds of lines uh, uh, that Leonora sings. And I like that very, very much, of course. Then I would not like to give up the other dramatic part. Being, and most of the time, the mezzos in particular roles have this responsibility of sort of eating up the, the, the scenery and that kind of thing on stage. And I wouldn't like to give up that particular part in, um, in uh, Trovatore because of that. But uh, one can't divide oneself in half. It's, it's unfortunate. To Il Trovatore, as Uchena, the gypsy woman, has been imprisoned by the villain Di Luna. Manrico, who has been brought up as Azucena's son, though in fact he is Di Luna's brother, tries to rescue her but fails and is thrown into the cell with her. In this duet, they remember their former happiness and dream of being happy together once more. Laura, 
raffreddano le scuole tue membre forse oh, e da questa tomba di vivi solo fuggir vorrei
Now, you were born in the Deep South, and that, of course, immediately raises one very important question. There is today, and it can't be an accident, a great generation of Negro singers who obviously now for the first time are getting the kind of opportunities that they didn't before and therefore the talent that was always, always there is now coming to the fore. They the yeah. Now what about your life? Have you found it dogged with difficulty because of this or...? In all truthfulness, I cannot say that it has been dogged with difficulties. No, I have, I suppose, if one believes in leading a charmed life, I, to a great extent, I would say 95% of my life has been a charmed life. I went into music when I felt I was ready to go into music, which was a little later than most people go into music as a profession. Um, and when I made up my mind to do this, people were very helpful to me from the beginning. I hoped that I had enough talent so that that was the main thing that uh, helps me, first of all, having the talent. But I didn't go through much of the suffering that many of my colleagues, I could name them, which I will not, but uh, I look around me and I hear stories from many of my colleagues to this day that they are having tremendous problems yet in getting started. I did not have it. I was one of the lucky ones. But because I am a lucky person, or I have been very fortunate, because things just happen to fall into place right for me, I cannot overlook the struggle that is still going on in the States. Because there were places in the United States when I began, and there are still places in the United States that I have not been to sing. And in all honestly, honesty, I don't wish to sing there because I have the feeling that if someone does not want me to sing in the place, I don't want to go. You sing, but you don't sing to segregated audiences. Who pays for a ticket comes in and sits where that ticket says he can sit and not because he's black, green or gray or whatever, yellow. I must say that America, that the United States have made has tremendous strides in this way and it has been also brought on by wonderful people like Martin Luther King who is now dead, and I'm very sorry that we, that we lost people like that in the Kennedy brothers. Um, and now Negroes themselves are beginning to realize it's a revolution going on in the States, as, as everyone knows, but, uh, and bloodshed. This is unfortunate, but as we, if we are realistic, we know that throughout history, uh, whenever there has been a struggle for anything, things were not always what we wanted them to be. But I feel that when my children grow up, and my grandchildren, it will be, uh, I hope that in the United States it will not be, oh, there is a black singer. It's a singer. Right. It's a human being. There is a black this, there is a black that. Oh, and it's such a, a marvelous thing because it's black, and what, uh, look at the progress we have made. Because as you know, in the United States, the first Negro to sing at the Metropolitan Opera was Marian Anderson, and it was at the end of her career. That was the first doors to be open. And now the struggle goes on in the States. I think the women have sort of gone forward to, 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 to break through barriers. The men are trying to do, and this is, of course, goes back to the, what the whole problem was about in the first place when it comes to the black man. He's still trying to, 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 to find his place and his niche in uh, American life. It's happening in all, in all kinds of little places and in also big places. But in music as yet, many of them have had to come yet to, to Europe and start. But when you were a child, your family moved from the South, from New Orleans, to California. Now, was that a conscious, deliberate decision because of this on the part of your parents? Oh, very definitely so. My father is a builder, he's a contractor. And at that particular time, he was not a licensed contractor in New Orleans because, again, because of the, his color, he, he wasn't able to be where, what he is now. Because of his travel to the North of the United States, he decided, one year when we were quite young that he didn't want us to be brought up in that kind of heavy oppressive depressing situation but at that time 
Was your musical talent already apparent? Did your oh, father yes. think, for instance, that you, you might well have a career? In oh, yes. In fact, my mother was the one who discovered yes. that I had the voice at five and a half years old. She must have heard me. I don't know how it all came about. She must have heard me humming or singing around the house, some tune, a, a hymn that I'd heard in church. And she said, I want to teach you a, a little hymn. So she taught me a hymn to sing in church. And when I sang, it was the first time that my father had heard. Now, my father had an avocation of music. And in the South, while in the South, he went to a, a university down there, which was an, a Negro university, and he took courses in music. This is why he was the director of the chorus, and he had found out a little bit about the breathing and the diaphragm. And here he was at, I was five and a half years old, and he started telling me about the diaphragm. And they tried to make a soprano out of me from a very early age. And he said, no, don't do this. Let it develop. It was very wise. I, I marvel at him. Let it develop normally. If you are going to be whatever you're going to be, you will be when you are in the right hands at the right time. And uh, his words have come true. It was her father who taught Shirley Barrett Mozart's Alleluia, and Exultate Jubilate has since virtually become her signature tune. Considering how short your career has so far been, you've packed a good deal into it. And we've particularly been lucky to hear you so often at Covent Garden. Well, what are the roles, what are the roles you've sung at Covent Garden, apart from one which you no longer sing, Ulrika? Ah, uh, Amneris, Eboli, Atsuchena, by Verdi, and uh, Eboli, Princess Eboli, also by Verdi, from Don Carlos. Now, the aria you're going to sing for us in his program it's particularly dramatic even for Verdi O Don Fatale in which Eboli curses the gift of beauty which she has which has caused nothing but tragedy to those around her oh, how do you approach that? Well it is also again almost from the standpoint of, of having a character that there, there are no, no such things I think there's no such thing as a one dimensional a person with one facet or, you know Eboli is no different. 
She starts out, she's a very beautiful, I see her as a very beautiful woman, very much liked by the court, very close to the queen. She starts out as a very young, wonderful, in love with Don Carlo, very wonderfully happy human being. Also the mistress of the king, and that's something else again, which makes it all the, the more complicated. And then she comes to the, the part that she becomes vindictive. And then this part shows her as a person who is really very, so distraught and angry at herself because she has caused torment to people that she really loved. And she really finds out in the end that she still loves the queen very much. She loves Don Carlos very much too. She knows that he does not love her at this particular point. But because she has made a mistake, she is willing to try to undo this mistake by saving his life. And this is my thoughts when I get into this aria.
Now, in every singer's life, there are a number of peaks to be climbed, debuts at the various fam op famous opera houses in the world. But there's one which, whatever you do about it, and however different opera houses compare, is inevitably, in a singer's mind, I'm sure, as in an audience's, one of the pinnacles, and that's the Scala. True. Now, you made your debut at the Scala with what? I, as Delilah, in Samson and Delilah. And um, it was a role also that I had been thinking about for a long time, but always, when people mentioned it to me, I always felt I wasn't ready for it yet. Not yet, not yet, not yet. And finally, La Scala asked me after 11 years, they hadn't had a new production in 11 years, and they wanted to put this, op this opera on with me. And I felt that already this was uh, an honor for, as you say, the great Scala to want me as a person who had not made a debut yet, to make a debut in a production that had not been done for 11 years, and also my debut, debut in the role and in the house. Mm -hmm. So, of course, I, I had many moments of nervousness, I should say, about this but I'm so happy that I did do the role there and the people liked it very very much and I enjoyed it and to the extent that I, it's one role that I would love to do over and over again in other you know places in the world is there something special about it you can say it's uh, almost like Carmen but it really isn't because whereas Carmen is a person of the earth a gypsy, if you might want to call her that. Delilah is, is a love goddess, goddess, whereas Carmen would not walk on stage and flaunt her hips around and so forth. I have the feeling, at least the way I think about Delilah, that Delilah would do this. Mm -hmm. Because at this particular time, she is really after a particular kind of thing, which has nothing to do with really loving a person. It, the end is to get a secret. And to do this, one must, as the Italians say, you know, it's finta always a falseness and to get this over on stage you must overdo it so that people will really feel that you really are sincere about the actions that you're doing you know
Beatrice has been permitted to bring back his beloved from the dead on condition that he does not look at her or speak to her. Unable to bear her reproaches, he turns to look at her and she sinks dead in his arms. Orpheus responds with, what is life to me without thee? Aida, the hero Radames, is about to be tried for treachery. 
treachery committed because of his love for the slave girl Aida. Amneris, daughter of the king, offers to save him if he will return her love for him. But he spurns her, saying that he loves only Aida. Amneris abandons him to his fate, and he is condemned to death. She repents. Too late.
di morir.
Oh. 